Hi everyone, this is Balash from Racing Brick. Before I left for Denmark about a month ago, I asked you guys to send questions for the Technic team. Thanks for your enthusiasm, there were literally hundreds of comments under that video. I had the opportunity to spend some time with two designers from the Technic team. Some of that discussion is unfortunately still under embargo, but there was also time for some general questions. Since there were sets in the room that I cannot show you yet, I decided to summarize the designer's answers instead of showing weird cutouts of the recorded discussion. So, the people in the room were Aurelien Rufiange, design manager for Technic, and Lee McPilly, a senior designer who recently joined the Technic team and previously worked at LEGO Education. I'm sure you remember Aurelien, he was the lead designer of the Bugatti Chiron. As he said, he was focusing on other tasks lately, so he only designed smaller sets, like the Monster Jam Megalodon. So, to the questions. There were tons of inquiries about future products, potential products, whether LEGO is going to make this car or that machine, to which, of course, we didn't get answers. I'm going to focus on a couple of main topics that we talked about and summarize the discussion. First, about the Technic team and the whole design process of a set. There are currently 16 designers on the Technic team, which is a pretty surprising number, at least I didn't think there would be that many people. There is a new wave of designers who have either come from other teams or have been recruited externally. That was a necessary move because some designers who have been with the company for decades and made iconic sets for us are already getting closer and closer to retirement, so I guess we can expect some fresh new design approaches in the coming years. And now for the process itself. Every year between September and November, team members sit down to talk about the next assortment, so this time already for 2025, creating concepts and so on. But, and this is important to know, the Technic team cannot decide alone which sets they want to make. There can be a discussion about what the team could do, they can bring ideas and suggestions, but the decisions are made at a higher level. Usually they are given a brief, for example, that they should build a car, with a certain game or another partner, whether it is motorized or not, and a certain budget assigned for the project. Let's say you have to design a new Bugatti, the target price is $50 and you have two months to do it. Usually a certain designer is assigned to a specific project, but they don't work totally alone. There are many people on the Technic team with different backgrounds, skills and experience, and they help each other solve challenges. In mentioning the Bugatti, there were many questions about license sets, why we see so many of them, and how they choose a particular make or model. Well, it shouldn't be a big surprise, but licensing deals are not made directly by the team or designers, as they are simply assigned to a project. According to marketing people, sets developed with IP partners sell well because they are more recognized and demanded by most customers. In the lower price segment, cars, especially branded cars, are the most popular among children, and that is the reason why we see so many of these each year. Now let's talk about the complexity of the models, how it relates to the age rating, the size of the model, and the thing you call color vomit in the sets. The complexity of a model is primarily related to the volume of the build, as it relates to the patience level of the builder. LEGO's general view is that younger builders have less patience, so smaller models are intended for them. However, the age rating is not only related to the complexity, but also influences the parts used, the level of color coding, how easy it is to find and distinguish the parts in the bags. But even with the 18 plus sets, adult novice builders are considered. That might be the reason why we don't get the expert sets that many of you would like LEGO to make. Color coding is very important for LEGO. It may be less strict for bigger sets aimed at experienced builders, but there are rules that the designers simply can't change. There's an internal department that coordinates these rules, and even if other teams or certain sets can get a Technic part in a strange color that is required for that build, in some cases the Technic designers are not allowed to use that out-of-system color in their projects. So, even if the black 16-tooth gear appeared in the Pac-Man set, we probably won't see it in a Technic set anytime soon. In some recent sets, the color matching efforts has been noticeable, such as the 4GT or the Peugeot, where literally only the bright blue pins stand out. I asked specifically about this, but unfortunately it is out of the designer's hands. They said that because of the general rules of color coding, they don't expect the blue pins to change anytime soon. As for the famous internal color vomit, it simply supports the building process and helps identifying and distinguishing elements. As I mentioned earlier, they also have to think about inexperienced builders and don't want to make the building process frustrating and I can absolutely support that. We talked a little bit about the age rating on the boxes. 
Before the introduction of the 18 plus category, it more or less represented the complexity of the model, but now it's more for marketing purposes to differentiate the sets for kids and adults. As Aurelian said, he would also prefer a categorization by complexity, such as level 1, 2, 3 and so on, to understand how challenging the build is, but since this is a company-wide classification, I think it can only be changed globally for all themes, which probably won't happen. Regarding a few pieces introduced in new colors versus having a complete set of panels or beams in a particular color, it is always a difficult balance to find. The theme itself and potentially the IP partner defines the color of a particular set, which can drive the introduction of elements in new colors, but designers also try their best to have a versatile parts inventory in a certain color. It also relates to the production aspect and how many parts are produced and stocked at the same time. Introducing a new color or a new element means that something existing has to disappear, so it's a very complex system with many different aspects. If we talk about the colors, there is the question of the problematic shades of certain parts, like here in Lime on the Lamborghinis or the red variants on the Ferrari. I asked specifically about this small Lamborghini, why it is in Lime despite the known problem with these parts, and apparently it is mainly the IP partner's decision. If they really want to stick with that color, despite the possible variations, then they get what they want. Aside from efforts to eliminate the differences through manufacturing improvements, there is now an additional checkpoint in the set's development process that looks for these potential color ecosystems and tries to mitigate them with the designers or the IP partners. Next topic, functional technic parts versus panels and other decorative elements. For a long time, development focused more on the functional pieces, but with the increasing number of licensed sets, there was also a demand for more accurate shaping in the Technic team, so more panel fairings and other decorative elements have been introduced recently. I know that doesn't make people who want certain new functional parts happy, but apparently that's been the trend lately. There are a certain number of new parts or recolors for each set, so it's up to the designer to decide if the desired functionality or look can be achieved with the existing parts, or if something new is needed. Of course, if the set really calls for it, new functional parts will be introduced, such as the new gearbox elements in the recent Yamaha motorcycle, which will certainly be used in several future sets. Now let's talk a bit about the powered up elements and control plus. I asked the guys how much influence they have on the electronic components available to use. For example, can they request a specific type of motor or a physical controller, because the touchscreen controls are still my number one pet peeve with control plus. As they said, hardware development is a difficult question. Of course they can request something, but the development process for electronic hardware is much longer than for new LEGO parts for example. It can take up to 5 years or even more, because there are so many different regulations and tests required. So it's more like a family of hardware parts is developed by a special team at once, where of course the Technic folks can make suggestions, but after that they can mostly use the components that were developed initially. I don't think that's good news for people who want a dedicated controller for these sets. I think we should have seen that in the last few years if it existed. Regarding the Control Plus profiles, I asked how much influence a designer has on the profile that is created for the set design and unfortunately not much. They may suggest the functionality or interface of a particular machine, but again the development is done by a completely different team or even an external studio, so they don't have much influence on the end result. Additionally, user interface development is done after the set is finished, so the LEGO designer may already be working on another project when the Control Plus profile is created. This means that designers have to create their own temporary profiles while they are working on the sets. As it turns out, the Technic team members have asked several times for the ability to switch sides of the controllers to swap throttle and steering, but that wasn't implemented in the profiles. So if you want to blame someone, just don't blame the Technic team. Ironically, the swap is available in the leaf hair crane profile, so it's technically quite possible and probably not that difficult to implement, but we got it for a set where it's not particularly important, since we are talking about different crane control functions here. One last quick question was related to the official B models. I thought they might be possible again as they have a decent number of designers on the team now, but apparently it's not just about the number of the designers, but mostly about the additional resources and teams that are needed, people to create and validate the building instructions, and also how to meet a certain fixed development timeframe for the sets. So we shouldn't expect Tactic B models to come back anytime soon, especially for larger models. So folks, those were all the answers I could get. 
I know it sounded a bit like why they can't do this or won't do that, but those were the topics that came out most frequently in your questions. The rest of the interview will be published when the embargo is lifted, and unfortunately though I can't tell you when that will be. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments section. If you like this video then please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe with notifications as more exciting LEGO videos are coming soon. See you next time, bye bye.